غیر مسلم خاتون وہ اپنے پیشے اور اپنی صحافت کے اس پیشے کی دنیا میں ایک جرت آمیز اقدام اٹھاتی ہے اور این افغانستان پر مسلط جنگ کے دوران بھیس بدل کر افغانستان میں داخل ہو جاتی ہے اور وہاں پہ دنیا کے بقول ان اجڑ لوگوں کی گرفتاری میں آ جاتی ہے ان کی قید میں آ جاتی ہے کہ جو دنیا کا نظام نہیں چلا سکتے جو دہشت گرد ہیں جو قابل گردت زدہ نہیں ہیں لیکن یہ ایک عجیب تماشا ہے یہ ایک عجیب موجزہ ہے کہ جب وہ خاتون صحافی اپنے قیدیوں کے ہاں سے رخصت ہوتی ہے اور آزاد ہوتی ہے اور ان تمام لمحات کے بعد کہ جب وہاں پہ امریکی بمباری ہو رہی ہوتی تھی تو اس کے جو گرفتار کرنے والے تھے وہ اپنی جانوں سے زیادہ اپنی قیدی کی زندگی کی حفاظت کرتے تھے ان کے حسن سلوک سے ان کی ان میلی اور بڑی ہوئی اور شاید ناتراشیدہ جو حیت تھی جنگ کے زمانے میں اس سب کچھ کے باوجود وہ اسلام کے ایک روشن چہرے سے آشنا ہوئی قید سے رہا ہونے کے بعد اس نے اسلام قبول کیا میری بہن ایوان ریدلی اب اس وقت اسے بھی امت مسلمہ کا ہر فرد جانتا ہے انہوں نے اپنے بہت مصروف شیڈیول کے باوجود اپنی مصروفیات کے باوجود جماعت اسلامی پاکستان کی دعوت کو قبول کیا وہ اس اجتماع میں تشریف لائیں وہ اس وقت اپنی بہنوں کے ساتھ موجود ہیں ہمیں بہت سارے تقاضے یہ ملے جنہیں یہ اطلاع ملی کہ وہ یہاں پہ ہیں کہ وہ یہاں سٹیج سے آ کے خطاب کریں لیکن یہ ممکن نہیں ہو سکا نہیں روایات نے ساتھ دیا اور میں اب دعوت خطاب دے رہا ہوں اپنی بہن کو جو ہمیں اپنی سگی بہنوں کی طرح عزیز ہیں Now I request my dear sister, a great daughter of Islam, who is as dear to our hearts as our real sisters, as our real mothers. Dear sister in Islam, Sister Yvonne Ridley, the microphone is with you. Please, your brothers are waiting for your speech. اگر ناروں سے استقبال کرنا ہے تو ذرا بلند آہنگ ہو کر نارے تکبیر نارے تکبیر سسٹر ایوان ریڈلی محترم خاتین سے درخواست ہے کہ وہ ہمیں یہ اطلاع ملی کہ مائک تیار ہے آپ اپنی گفتگو شروع کیجئے بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم برادرز اور سسٹرز السلام علیکم I first came to Pakistan seven years ago following the horrific events of 9-11. I am sure every single one of you can remember that day very well. It was the dawn of a frightening new era. It was the time when George W. Bush said, you are either with me or with the terrorists. Who here is with George W. Bush now? Who here stands shoulder to shoulder with the President of the United States? He might be gone from the White House soon, but his rotten legacies live on. And one of those legacies is the never-ending war on terror. His war on terror gave birth to the cages of Cuba, to Guantanamo Bay, where hundreds of our brothers were sold like slaves to the Americans. 
I wish this obscenity had happened somewhere else, but the stark reality is retired General Pervez Musharraf and his men got rich on the back of this vile trade. He even admitted it in his autobiography. How could Muslims sink so low as to sell their brothers like parcels of meat? Because of this, an international organization called Cage Prisoners was launched from London, and its work initially focused on the torture and detention of those brothers held in Guantanamo, a boil on the face of humanity. I became one of the patrons of Cage Prisoners and tried to raise awareness to get justice for our brothers in Islam. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever believe that sisters would also be swept up in the war on terror. Never did I ever, in my darkest nightmares, imagine they would be brutalized, raped, and tortured. But they have. I suppose we should not have been too surprised. After all, it seems the US president is totally disinterested in the suffering of others, especially when it comes to Muslims. Muslim blood is a cheap commodity as far as the US military is concerned. The rivers of blood in Iraq and Afghanistan have now been swollen with the blood of innocent Pakistanis. How did we allow ourselves to sleepwalk into this outrageous nightmare? But what still catches my breath is the disinterest expressed by brothers and sisters across the Muslim world to the plight of sisters. And I'm talking about all corners of the Muslim world, including here in Pakistan, a country I have grown to love and regard as my second home. I salute those dear sisters in Lal Masjid who were mocked and ridiculed for trying to close down a brothel. They were mocked and ridiculed for their piety and many of them were martyred as they fought for common decency. How did we allow that to happen? How did we sink so low? Newspaper columnists and writers here in Pakistan sneered at their efforts and called their work the Talibanization of Islamabad. Anywhere else in the world, they would have been praised as freedom-fighting warriors and as righteous individuals for trying to close down a sex industry which clearly exploits women. But it's not just the heroic sisters from Lal Masjid which brings me here today. Five years ago, when cage prisoners first brought the mystery disappearance of Dr. Afia Siddiqui to the attention of the media, no one listened. Okay, five years ago, few of us believed that the Bush administration could really sanction the kidnapping of a mother and her three children. I know, because I was one of those doubters. But what changed for me was my own journey to Guantanamo Bay earlier this year. For some bizarre reason, the Americans agreed to give me and filmmaker David Miller unprecedented access to the world's most notorious prison. And even more amazingly, they let us out again. I am probably one of the few Muslims who flew half away, halfway round the world to get to Guantanamo without having to be shackled, shaved and abused. The experience, as brief as it was, left me shocked. In fact, as I left the maximum security block at Camp Delta, one of the young American guards asked me how I felt. I looked at him and I told him, I am speechless, lost for words. He said proudly, yes, it's awesome, isn't it? And that is basically the sentiment 
in there from the most basic recruit through to the medical staff, the psychiatrists, right up to the rear admiral in charge. There is nothing temporary about Guantanamo. Do not expect it to be closed down when the new man steps into the White House. I don't know who the new man will be, Barack Obama or John McCain, and the US media can't decide either. They're waiting for a message from Osama bin Laden. Can you believe it? This is all they've been writing about for the last few days. What will Osama say? When will he release a tape? Who will he endorse? One of the first people I interviewed when I returned home from Guantanamo was Brother Moazam Beg, a British detainee who went through untold atrocities at the hands of the so-called civilized American military. He was kidnapped in the middle of the night from his home in Islamabad and sold to the Americans for $5,000. And while we've spoken many times before, this latest interview triggered something new for me. I had read his book, Enemy Combatant, and often heard him refer to the screams of a female prisoner in Bagram. But in truth, while I never questioned Moazam's story, I assumed that what he had heard were a series of pre-recorded tapes performed by actors as part of a CIA-FBI mental torture program. So in this latest interview with Moazam, I threw this theory at him, and he responded, saying he knew the screams were real because other brothers in Guantanamo had talked about the woman who I refer to as the Grey Lady of Bagram. More importantly, he said there were eyewitness accounts, brothers who'd actually seen the female detainee. Bagram, he said, was far worse than anything in Guantanamo. Did you know four Arab brothers escaped from Bagram in July 2005? Did you? Well, this is something the Americans do not want you to know. But they did, and when they fled that hellhole, one brother gave an interview on film about the plight of a particular prisoner. The prisoner was the woman that Moazam Beg heard scream through the night, every night, without fail. When the Arab brother saw her, he said she had clearly lost her mind. She had been raped, abused and used without mercy by those dogs who wear the uniforms in Bagram. Her state was so wretched, the male detainees in Bagram went on hunger strike. Without revealing our sources, we soon established the woman in Bagram was registered in U.S. intelligence documents as prisoner 650. I was horrified. I suddenly realized that the screams Moazam had heard were real. As you know, I was held in Afghanistan by the Taliban for 10 days. They were 10 terrifying days, even though I was given the key to lock my own door, even though my captors always knocked and asked for permission before entering my room. Whenever I needed to use the bathroom, I only had to ask and I was escorted, and an armed guard would remain outside while I washed and showered in complete privacy. But no such respect or decency has been given to prisoner 650. No, this sister has been brutalized. She had to share the same open toilet as the men, and there were no closed doors or shower curtains when she wanted to wash. No wonder Moazam still hears her cries and screams today. I also have started to hear her cries and screams 
And that is why I came to Pakistan in July to ask people to help. I turned to Imran Khan, a great politician and a man of integrity. He agreed to organize a press conference and was so moved by the mission to find prisoner 650. I begged the media to help demand the release of this woman. I pointed out that my story had made headlines and front page news for the entire 10 days of my captivity when I was held by the Taliban after 9-11. But let's face it, those headlines were attracted because I'm a white Western woman. Back in Britain, Lord Nazir Ahmed answered my call for help. Not only did he submit a series of hard-hitting questions to the British government, he roused the Pakistan media in London and announced that if prisoner 650 was not released, then he and I would go to the gates of Bagram and demand her release. It was inevitable that people would assume prisoner 650 was Dr. Afia Siddiqui, and the awkward question started to be asked after more than 100 media turned up at our scrambled press conference. A cage prisoner report was handed out giving the wider picture of the disappeared in Pakistan. Then suddenly, Dr. Afia Siddiqui emerged as though a magician had pulled a rabbit out of the hat. She emerged in a dazed and confused state outside the governor of Gardeza's offices in Afghanistan. Imagine that. Five years after her disappearance in Karachi, and according to the FBI, she was carrying in her handbag pieces of bomb-making equipment and photographs of various landmarks in New York City. What nonsense! What Rubbish! How dare the FBI or other American intelligence insult us in this way, expecting us to swallow this garbage? Of course, the FBI lost much of its credibility years ago when its chief, J. Edgar Hoover, was revealed to be a transvestite who preferred to wear a red dress and be called by the name of Mary. Hoover, probably one of the most powerful men in America of his time, was the originator of dirty tricks, lies and deceits, and his legacy obviously lives on. Even today, it seems FBI agents live in a fantasy world, but instead of mincing around in red dresses, they spend their time dressing up the truth with layer after layer of lies. This was quite evident with the story of Dr. Afia Siddiqui. It is no coincidence that cage prisoners had raised the issue of Dr. Siddiqui less than two weeks before. Many of you know Dr. Siddiqui's story. She had been shot by a U.S. soldier at close range after she apparently managed to overpower one of his colleagues. This woman is less than 70 pounds. This story is garbage. I'm told she's in constant pain and I'm sure that her sister who's here today will elaborate more. But you know what makes this even worse? While our sister lies in agony awaiting to be tried for this nonsense in American courts, two of her children are still missing. Where are they? And I'll tell you something else which should make your blood run cold. The Americans have now admitted that the Grey Lady of Bagram does exist, that I did tell the truth about prisoner 650. But Dr. Afia Siddiqui is not prisoner 650, the Grey Lady of Bagram. We still do not know who is prisoner 650. We still do, do not know where she is. And we do not know how many other Muslim women, maybe Arab women, maybe Asian women. It doesn't matter, but they are Muslim women. They are our sisters. 
We don't, don't, don't know just how many are being held as female enemy combatants. Yes, that is what the Pentagon told me they are called, female enemy combatants. Today, I am begging each and every one of you, as your sister in Islam, to help me find prisoner 650. If you remain silent, I may never find her. But I'll tell you something now. I can hear her screams. And when you go to bed tonight, you will also hear her screams. Have we all sunk so low that the cries of this sister will remain unanswered? The time has come when the people of Pakistan need to restore the pride of this great country. You here today can set the agenda. You here today can make a change. You here today can get rid of those rancid, rotten politicians and their weasel words. Those in power only seem great because they try and keep you on your knees. Rise up and remember, as Muslims, we bow to no one but Allah. When the people lead, the leaders will follow. Pakistan Zindabad! Brothers, sisters, I'm now going to hand you over to Dr. Fauzia Siddiqui, who will give you more details about the plight of her sister. Salam alaikum.